so, I guess we're ready. All right, so hey everyone, uh, my name is Ross, and I'm gonna be talking about a song from a video game, very different from everything else uh, that's been covered in this course so far. Uh, the song is called Freeze Easy Peak from the game Banjo-Kazooie uh, that was released on the Nintendo 64. Just curious, who's heard of Banjo-Kazooie? Okay, a few of you, yeah, it's pretty good. Like, I asked my CS students, and only two of them had heard of it. But, yeah, all right, so it's a word here, I like it. So, first, let me talk a little bit about the game. Uh, this is Banjo-Kazooie. Uh, there's some text missing here, but uh, it was released by the company called Rareware in 1998. Uh, and the game was part of what people call today the, the golden age of Nintendo collectathons, which are these games on Nintendo consoles where you'd have this grand, big adventure across many different diverse worlds, deserts, uh, snowy fields, forests, things like that. Uh, they really started with Super Mario 64, uh, but then the other three games here were all made by Rare. Uh, and these were really sort of the, the best collectathons that, that people still talk about today. Um, Sony, in addition, uh, had its own response, its own collectathon series, Spyro. Um, but Nintendo was really the, the main champions of this genre. So uh, we have some more text missing, uh, but this says that music really plays a, a major uh, role, and it's a major theme in the game. Um, to start off, you got Banjo, the bear and Kazooie the bird, those are the two main characters of the game. Um, the objective throughout the game is that you'll be collecting musical notes in each of the levels in order to unlock note doors which give you access to more areas in the game. And of course the soundtrack um, is a huge aspect of it and that's what I'll be focusing on today. Um, now what was sort of the inspiration behind um, the focus on music in the game? Well, here's a quote from the composer Grant Kirkhope himself. Get rid of this, this, this guy. Let's get a perfect family in there. Where? Where would it be? That was it. He went from being Dream to being Kazoo. And it's all going instruments. Banjo, Piccolo, Bruce, all of those. You know, you're like, yes, yes, let's do it right now. All right, so this tells you the backstory. There was this beta game called Dream in development. Um, had some issues in development, and then eventually they decided to scrap it uh, and in the speed of creativity, they came up with the idea of using music as a theme to a game. They threw a bear and a bird together, and we ended up with Banjo-Kazooie. So, here's the composer, Grant Kirkhope. Uh, he composed for Rare for about a decade, starting in 1998, for some of their most popular games. Um, some others like GoldenEye uh, and Perfect Dark. Uh, and then, since then, he's done work for the Civilization series, this game called Viva Pinata in the Xbox that had a really nice soundtrack too. Um, but Banjo Kazooie is definitely considered to be one of his best works. And for many different reasons. He really knew how to take the hardware on the N64 to its limits. Uh, he created music that was very tightly integrated with the gameplay itself in some ways that are very evident and some ways that are very surprising. Uh, we'll talk about those. And he really helped to immerse the player in the world of Banjo-Kazooie and, and made the game a very memorable experience. So first let me talk about some of the audio capabilities, or maybe the in capabilities, of the 64 hardware. It wasn't exactly a great machine for composing audio on. There was no dedicated sound chip on it. Instead, you had the RCP, the Reality Co-Processor, Co, because it had to handle both the graphics and the audio. Uh, and so you had no dedicated power um, for fancy audio effects and things like that. And in addition, there really wasn't much space, either on the memory of the uh, console itself or on the cartridges that came with it. So you had to really be careful about how much stuff you were putting in the game. Uh, and it was pretty slow to get to it, too. Now, with uh, some very, very heavy optimizing by Rare, some crazy optimizations. Scary, I, I did a lot of research into this, and uh, I've, you know, I've worked with some low-level stuff, but it's, <laughs> it's insane what they did. Um, but the re end result was that Grant had about 70, at least 70 samples to work with, um, that include sound effects, and he had about 16 MIDI channels per song. Um, not exactly MIDI, the N64 uh, had its own format they used, um, but essentially MIDI channels. 
But still, even with all the samples that they were able to fit into the game, I mean, they, they compressed this to the absolute maximum, but Grant was still constrained by the quality of the instruments he could fit because they had to be so small. Uh, and so to make up for this, he really had to design melodies and design songs that would really stand out and stick in people's minds. And so that brings me to the song I'll be talking about today, Free ZZ Peak. Uh, and I think the best thing to do is really to play the song first for you all and get you in the mood, get you thinking about it and your mind's turning. Uh, so while it's playing, focus on maybe the instrumentation, maybe the rhythm, maybe the harmony, uh, maybe anything else you can come up with. Uh, and I'm, I have a render of the sheet music uh, that I made in Sibelius that you can follow up uh, on, or you can follow along with here, or look at your sheet music. So, let's see, have a listen. <laughs> song keeps looping uh, basically forever. <laughs> so I hope you got, I got you into some kind of good mood. Um, but what exactly mood did I get you in? Well, I asked my students uh, what they thought of the song. I played it to them before discussion one day. Uh, and got a lot of good responses. People seemed to think it was pretty cheery and upbeat, uh, except for number 34 in particular, <laughs> and it was melancholy. I was like, what? How do you get melancholy out of this? This is, you know, like this frozen wonderland uh, of adventure. And so let's, uh, but, but a lot of people did uh, get it right. So, uh, for example, one person said, there's a, there's a horn-like quality that's used to keep the tempo and makes everything sound really uh, upbeat. And yeah, I, I agree. The main instrument here is this very powerful French horn that is sort of very upbeat in the song, but also sort of I think of it as like this horn that's bellowing out, you know, over the top of a, a mountain peak, and this gives this very powerful booming effect. Some, of, some other people said it was very uh, plucky and cheerful. And yeah, that's definitely true. There's also a glockenspiel in there. Sounds a lot like a xylophone. Uh, makes it very lighthearted and cheery. Uh, and then someone else said sleigh bells, I think. And to that, mm, close. There's a tambourine. Um, but yeah, I guess that, that does sound a bit like sleigh bells. You know, I can imagine Santa's sleigh carrying a tambourine on it, maybe. And there's a whole bunch of other instruments in here. Violins, cellos, bassoons, piccolos. Grant was very uh, experimental with a lot of his instrumentation. And it makes the songs very interesting. Uh, now let's talk about some of the rhythm and harmony of the song. So this song is very bright. It's in a major 
uh, scale based around the pentatonic scale, uh, which is used in a lot of jazz and um, especially like folk songs and even children's songs a lot of times. Um, but it also features a lot of Grant's famous chromaticism. Like in the strings, he loves doing that. Um, next, we also have what are called oompa rhythms in the bass. But very, very rhythmic, um, obvious sound in the bass um, that gives it a very driving feeling. There's also a lot of, he uses inverted textures and melodies where the melody likes to jump around different instruments, and even sometimes it goes into the bass. So yeah, the bass is playing the melody. Uh, and then finally, there's some interesting complex harmony that he uses throughout the song. For instance, uh, this one point, the horn, uh, that's supposed to be resolving. <laughs> and it ends on this really nice resolution, but this, this really dirty resolution, the C major 7, where the B and the C are right next to each other. So it makes this very dirty resolution, this awesome sound um, that I just love. <laughs> Now, another interesting thing here is that the song is dancing between two keys. Now, uh, it does modulate often, and I'm curious if anyone caught what the modulation was. So, for example, in the first two lines, or actually on the, on the second line here, it starts off in what looks like C major, but then we have a modulation to another key. What key is that? C sharp major? F sharp major, yeah, yeah. This, this is a modulation from C sharp to F sharp major, right? Yeah. And what kind of interval is that? Tritone. Tritone, exactly, yeah. So Grant is using the tritone, the devil's interval, this evil, horrible uh, interval, in, in sort of a jolly way, making in a very lighthearted song. So why is he doing this, and why does it work? Well, it turns out this was a very deliberate design choice by Grant. Um, the game itself, Banjo-Kazooie, is all about exploring this interesting relationship um, between this bear and this bird that are sort of complete opposites. You have Banjo the bear that's a very well-mannered, sweet-natured honey bear. He's kind of lazy, kind of timid. Um, and meanwhile, Kazooie the bird is sort of this cheeky, sarcastic bird who's always foul-mouthing other players and Banjo has to tell her to shut up. Uh, so, in, in, the use, in Grant's use of the tritone here, he's, he's trying to mimic the interplay between these two characters. And he does this throughout the soundtrack. A lot of songs feature this tritone heavily, and it's a signature part of Grant's style, and it's why his music is so memorable, and people like and enjoy his music so much today. And another thing I'll mention are variations of themes. So every area in the game, Banjo Kazooie, features different variations on that theme. So, for example, whether you are indoors or outdoors, a different song might play. Uh, there's another stage, Click Clock Wood, that has four variations of the song, each for a different season. And then there's versions for special events that happen in each level, um, lots of things. And the one interesting technique, one way to do this, uh, is through what's called channel fading. So in each song, there are, like I said, 16 instrument channels that can play, but not all of them are playing at any one time. And so what Grant does is he makes the music change dynamically as you're working through the level. So that you don't break any immersion to the player, you know, you, you walk somewhere up to some character and then the music sort of fades into this new version. Um, but there's no blackout, and so it, it keeps the, the player immersed in the adventure. Um, and if you're wondering whether people have done the math on this, yes, they have. Uh, and one thing I want to show you is this spreadsheet I found, where someone actually charted up all the instruments in the game, and every theme in the game, what instruments are used in every variation. And there's a whole bunch of variations throughout the game. So, yes. People care a lot about this stuff um, and do some really cool analysis on it. Okay, and to test your understanding of these variations, I have a little quiz for you. So we're going to have some fun here. I'm going to ask you some questions 
about some variations on the freeze easy peak theme you'll have heard, and you'll have to answer a question about them. <clears throat> Let's begin. First, where are you right now? Underwater. Underwater. Yeah, that's right. So every every song in the game has an underwater <laughs> variation that plays when you go underwater. Um, this is actually kind of a lie because on Freeze Easy Peak in particular, the water is too shallow to really swim in, and so the music never actually changes. So this version doesn't actually play in the game. But this is sort of proof that Grant uses this so commonly throughout the game that even though it doesn't play in the game, it still exists in the game's code. That's how much Grant uses this variation. And the heart communicates this fact. Question two. What are you doing right now? Running out of time? Yeah? Doing what? Race! Yes, you're racing. That's right. You're actually a walrus and racing a polar bear down the hill. So to communicate this, Grant uses sort of a, a ticking sound in the music, and of course the tempo speeds up dramatically. Okay, last question. What day is it? Christmas. Yeah, that's right. So, this one is actually also sort of a lie, um, because it doesn't actually play on Christmas, but there is a Christmas tree in the level. I think you get the idea. Um, Grant uses Christmas bells here whenever you're near the Christmas tree. So yeah, hey, you guys did a good job. The, the variations on the themes are of course meant to be uh, obvious to the listener, but they really help you get immersed in the level because they sort of play on your expectations of what's going on. Um, There's another way to make the, the levels more exciting. Oh, and since I said that the channels are often faded between each other, uh, you might ask, well, what happens if you play all the channels all at once? So, for example, here's the main overworld theme, not for Easy Peak, but it has many different variations, and if you play them all on top of each other, see if I can get it to play. It still sounds very cohesive even though you're currently listening to Freeze Easy Peak and a mountain and a beach and a uh, cavern all at once. So in conclusion, Grant Kirkhope is a very creative uh, and versatile composer who's excellent at composing melodies that really stick out to the listener. Um, he enjoys playing with different elements of his music to complement and enhance the gameplay, and he really helped to uh, give the game such an immersive experience that so many people are still nostalgic about today. Now, there's more that I couldn't fit into this video, um, like for example, how video game songs loop endlessly without sounding boring. That's a topic I'm very interested in, because I go to a YouTube channel about this stuff. Uh, and some other things that I couldn't talk about. Um, but if you're still curious about this sort of nostalgic community that's around the game, well, don't take my word for it. Take my montage. You start humming along to that classic music and boom, you've been playing for five hours and it just went by like that.